Come on in, everybody. I apologize for the short delay. We're going to get started in about a minute. Please find a seat. Hopefully you have a warm cup of coffee or a cold drink. Settle in for the next presentation. I hope you enjoy Dr. Meichenbaum and you're in for another treat with Dr. Weiss. Two different unique presentations. Like I promised, we delivered diverse topics by the best people in the field. Once again, I wanna thank you for joining us at the Higher Thought Institute, East meets West in psychotherapy. And I hope that you consider us for future continuing education needs. We will be releasing our winter schedule in the next few weeks. And we're gonna have great faculty, such as Dr. Breer, Dr. Courtois, Dr. Siegel, just to name a few but we will have diverse topics and the best people in the field. Now you're in for a treat. I'm gonna introduce our next presenter, Dr. Weiss. Dr. Weiss is an expert in the treatment of adult intimacy disorders and related addictions, most notably sex, porn, and relationship addictions. He's a clinical sexologist and practicing psychotherapist he frequently serves as an expert for major media like CNN, MSNBC, New York Times, and many, many others. He's an author of several books, his most recent, Prodependence, Moving Beyond Codependency. Rob has been presenting and training therapists throughout the United States and around the world for many, many years. Dr. Weiss has created and overseen nearly a dozen high-end addiction and mental health treatment facilities around the globe. I've known Rob for over 20 years. He's very passionate about his work. He's, ener he's an energetic presenter. He's a continual learner. And I, Rob, I appreciate your support over the years. You've done a great job for us over and over. And I wanna take a minute to congratulate Rob. Uh, I haven't seen him in a couple of years and he finished his PhD a year ago. And to me, that's a big, big ac accomplishment and it shows how Rob is committed to continuous learning. And I wanna give you a congratulations on that, Rob. You gotta be really proud, good work. So please help me welcome my friend, my colleague, Dr. Rob Weiss. Take away, Rob. Hey, good morning, folks, or good afternoon, wherever you might be. Thanks, Paul, for that great introduction. I have known Paul and been able to work for this organization when we actually used to do live presentations and when you have to come to us for many, many years, and it's a real gift to me. Um, and I also wanna say about the PhD thing that if any of you are listening and you're in your, um, oh, let's say over 55, and you're thinking, you know, it's a little past, I mean, now I just wanna be with my kids and you're not too old. And if there's something you wanna learn, I went out at 56 and got my PhD because I want to know more. And I don't say that, Paul was being very validating, but I say that because I want to encourage you that we never stop learning and we never stop growing. We can always become better therapists, clinicians, and counselors. So that's my experience. Uh, that's a little bit of encouragement, shot in the arm for you guys. Um, I just lost two years of my life. It wasn't that big a deal. Um, so um, let me talk a little bit about this talk before I talk about it. I have worked in the field of the addictions and uh, related mental health issues since 1985. I've been an active uh, treatment provider. I'm a licensed social worker since 1995. So I have been uh, published and uh, active and licensed for, uh, let's see, 05, 15, 25 years. I don't count so well. <laughs> and in that 25 years, I've worked in every, pretty much every kind of recent residential treatment, outpatient treatment, workshops. I've designed programs, uh, evolved programs, trained therapists. It's just, you know, you move up the ladder over the years. And one of the things that I have consistently seen over the past 20 years be problematic in treatment is this concept of codependency. So when you hear me sit and talk about the book that I wrote called Prodependence Moving Beyond Codependency, let me be really clear about the title. It does not mean um, here's a new way to move beyond your codependency or um, find new ways to get past that darn codependency. 
That's not the book I'm writing. When I talk about moving beyond codependency, I'm talking about our whole field. I'm talking about our whole culture moving beyond this concept um, because I think it's both problematic and in some ways abusive. Um, so I did my PhD dissertation on the subject of codependency. I had strong feelings about it from day one. I didn't believe it made, uh, had ever made the level of a pure clinical diagnosis and I wanted to disprove it. And that was my purpose. So those of you who are dedicated and love codependency, I ask you to hear me out. Just hear what I have to say. And for those of you who've been looking for a new way, maybe you'll find it in this. Remember we have had, well, let me not give the talk before I give it. Let me just start. Now I'm gonna give you a little role play here and I'm going to pretend something and then I'm gonna give you the same role play and I'm gonna pretend it in a different way. So let me lay out this first caregiving scenario for you. This is a medical caregiving solution, uh, situation. So I'm making this up. This is a role, role play. My spouse, my wife of 15 years, has been diagnosed with cancer. And she's very resistant to treatment. She doesn't want to do that chemo. She doesn't like radiation. She's looking for some you know, uh, other alternative form of care. We have three kids under the age of 14 at home, and the outcome is uncertain. She's quite ill. And in response to this crisis, I, her husband, go out of my way to help her and help my family, and I push aside all my own needs and desires in the process. I start working two jobs, I stop self-care, I stop recreational activities, I completely focus on them and their needs, I gain weight, I stop exercising, I lose sleep, and I worry all the time. In fact, as time goes by and my wife's not getting better, I start to feel sick a lot and I get nauseous and overwhelmed and I'm very hypervigilant. Every time I hear that door doorbell or phone, I just kind of jump. I, and I'm really kind of fearful a lot of the time about what's going to happen next in my family. In this caregiving medical scenario where my wife has cancer, how do you think my friends, my family members, my therapist, and my employer would react to the situation? What are the kinds of things they might say to advise and support me? Wouldn't they consider me and my family, in essence, to have been victimized by cancer? None of us thought when I get married, we weren't thinking this would happen, kids, life. Nobody thought you were going to get cancer. This thing happened to us, in us, to us. It ruined our lives and it made us turn everything around and live differently. And hopefully we'll get over it, but it's a major crisis. And I think most people in this scenario would come to me and say, you know, I think you're kind of a hero. You've stood by your wife. You stopped all those fun activities. You didn't go to the bar or, you know, you didn't sit around and go into the gym. You stayed with your wife night after night and you supported her. And I just think you're a hero. I know that's what people would say to me if my wife had cancer. Now I want to move on to another role play scenario. This is a scenario about addiction. So in this scenario, and it may sound familiar, my wife of 15 years is addicted to opiates and she's resistant to treatment. She doesn't believe in those 12 steps and all of that stuff. We have three kids at home under the age of 14. The outcome is uncertain. So in response to this crisis, I, as her husband, I go out of my way to assist her and care for my family, pushing aside my own needs and desires in the process. I start working two jobs, I stop self-care and recreational activities, I gain weight, I stop exercise, I lose sleep, and I worry all the time. In fact, over time, as she continues to drink and use, I feel sick, I feel overwhelmed, I'm hypervigilant every time I hear a door open or a bottle being picked up, and I'm afraid for my family much of the time. How do you think my friends, my family members, my therapist, and my employer would react to my caregiving in this situation? How do you think they would advise and support me? What kind of names might they call me? And what kind of advice might they give me that is, in my experience, often different than in the first scenario that we saw? Would they consider me, in essence, to have been, me and my wife, to have been victimized by opiates and alcohol? Because when I met her, there wasn't any real sign she was alcoholic. And, you know, she used to drink a little bit, but it didn't seem like a big deal. We didn't expect after her last surgery for her to get addicted to opiates and be completely awash in alcohol for three years. That just wasn't on our timeline. So clearly we were victimized, as the other couple was, by cancer. Only we've been victimized by this thing, by this disease called addiction. 
However, I don't believe that we're going to be treated in the same way as I don't think I'm going to be treated in the same way as the partner of someone who's physically ill, as opposed to the partner of someone who's mentally ill. And then I had to ask myself, well, what's the difference there? What, what, what's the real difference? Both partners are going through crises. Both families are going through a life crisis on some level. They don't know whether the uh, identified person with the problem is going to live or die, or, and everyone's kind of responding, reacting to that. So what's the difference in these two situations? Well, one is that addiction has always been stigmatized, always. So I would imagine if you're involved with an addict, have a relationship with an addict, or trying to help an addict, that you are probably going to be stigmatized too, as we do with our partners. Second of all, medical caregivers and caregivers in general are stigmatized too, but we stigmatize medical caregivers more with pity, that kind of, oh, poor dear kind of thing, than we actually do feel like they shouldn't be doing that or they should do something else. Caregiving, by the way, is of course a traditional female gender role, mother, nurse, social worker, teacher, and we know that those are already underpaid, undervalued, and understigmatized roles in our culture. Mental health care caregivers do have stigma by association as well, but it's not the same thing as addiction. Now, we also have a documented history in the addiction field of reacting to, blaming, shaming, hurting. Sorry, I'm gonna read that properly. We also have, because I wrote it, we also have a documented history in the addiction field of reacting to, blaming and shaming, hurting, angry and confused people who are just deeply fearful of losing their beloved family and spouse. Now there's nothing new about shaming female caregivers, especially in the addictions. Um, our, um, our, uh, our sort of leader of the field of history, or, so the person who's really studied the history of the addiction field is a guy by the name of William White. And if you want to read his doctoral studies and research on the history of AA from the 40s to the present, it's fascinating and it's something I did for my PhD. But he had a couple of things to say about al honors or partners of addicts and spouses and wives in particular. He said, and this is about in the 1940s, uh, just before the disease model came out, he said, the general view of the alcoholic wife depicted in the early AA and psychotherapy literature was that of a woman who was neurotic, sexually repressed, dependent, man-hating, domineering, mothering, guilty, and masochistic, and or hostile and nagging. And furthermore, the typical therapist view of the wife of an alcoholic in the 40s and 50s was, at that time generally, I would drink too if I were married to her. So you can see that this isn't something that came about with codependency. Let's examine, blame, and challenge the partner about what's wrong with them. This has been a continuing view in the addiction field that the partners somehow have a part in driving the addiction. And codependency is an attempt on some level to answer that question, what part does the partner have or the family have in driving the addiction? I would say to you, first of all, I would say they have no job whatsoever in driving the addiction because nobody can make me drink or use no matter what they do. I can leave them, I can get a divorce, I can hate them. There are a lot of things I can do in an unhappy relationship other than drink. And so I say to all the caregivers in the audience, maybe some of you who have alcoholic or addicted loved ones, that um, it is never your responsibility for them to go and use. You can yell at them, you can hate them, you can leave them, you can give them money. They're gonna do what they're gonna do. And it's not because you did it and offered them something because that's what they chose to do. So this whole concept in our culture that somehow caregivers are responsible for a relapse makes absolutely no sense to me, none at all. But I do believe that codependency puts some of the responsibility for the addict's problem onto the partner. And I think that's very, very problematic for a number of reasons. And I'm gonna go into that more. My question to you is what if codependency in its very sophisticated analytic look at women and all that stuff was really just another way, more sophisticated way of shaming caregivers and telling that there's something wrong with them for the love that they give. What if there's no there there? What if there isn't anything wrong with partners and caregivers and kids of alcoholics and drug addicts, except that they have lost the person who's most important to them and their life is an entire crisis and mess that they're trying to figure out. Isn't that enough to look at? in the moment of somebody's early recovery. Um, by the way, I wanna say something about this talk. 
there are those of you who have strong feelings about codependency and you work on it and you work on this concept of over-dependency in your, in your outpatient settings and maybe for a long period of time, helping people become more independent and focus on themselves and that's good work. What I'm talking about here in this talk is my experience more than any other, because I work in residential and inpatient treatment, that partners come in and parents come in so excited that they finally got this alcoholic or drug addict kid or husband or whatever it is into treatment. And they feel like they're gonna take that big sigh of relief, like, okay, they're in treatment, I can finally relax, I've done my job. And then they go to the first family group and they get told what's wrong with them and what they haven't been doing right. And what they need, that they need to look inside to see how they were a part of this problem. And I have to tell you, some get really pissed and some just walk out. And for years we have said, boy, these caregivers are difficult. I mean, they just don't understand. This is simple emblematic of how difficult they are. It never seemed to occur to us that we might be the problem, that the organization and the structure we gave to what was wrong with them was not something that fit them or felt comfortable to them. And they were reacting for a good reason. We have mostly put it on the partners and the family members. Well, they're not just owning their codependency. What if they don't have it? What if it doesn't exist? This whole idea that we're going to judge people before we even get to know them, just because they're a wife or the, just because you are the wife or the husband of a child of an alcoholic, that you get some kind of a label sets my hair on fire. Because I know that in every bit of clinical training I have, I've been told that you never ever diagnose someone when they're in a crisis. Well, when that man or woman or family walks into you or office and their husband, wife or father has just gotten sober or is still using, they're in a crisis. They're a mess. They're all over the place. They're nagging, they're screaming, they're complaining. They hate them, they love them. Why would you diagnose that person in any way except as someone who's going through an extremely difficult life crisis and is showing profound crisis-like symptoms? Over the past 35 years, and I've been around for all of it, we have seen multiple new treatment models developed for addicts. We have, uh, you know, Buddhist therapy and, and non-12-step uh, non, um, non recovery. We have equine and yoga and somatic. And we have all these theories and, and, and uh, methods that we apply to spouses, to addicts and, and, uh, and the addict community. But when it comes to formal research-based models for the treatment of family, loved ones and spouses, we have only one and it's the same one we've had for 35 years. It's codependency. And the problem with that, and there are lots of problems with it, is that, but one of them is that that model is sourced in early trauma. So it assumes that my early trauma is going to play out into my addictive relationship, which is going to continue and escalate the addiction. But that model, which I don't think we fully believe in and have begun to shift, it's still the model that it was. So you can evolve it, you can restructure it, you can advance it, you can give it little details, you can stretch it to meet the changing needs of our field. And I think they've changed tremendously because we've moved absolutely into a period where we're looking at attachment as a primary um, goal of, of human health. And that wasn't the case in the 1980s when this was written. Um, so we have no new fully articulated models for the treatment of spouses and love addicts, uh, of treatment of the spouses and the loved ones of addicts in 35 years. I've read it all, trust me. There are a couple of good books, there's no model. Now, let's talk about how we got here. These four books defined and dominated the field and the concept of codependency in the 1980s. They laid out the underlying beliefs and concepts of that, I call it a drama model theory, which remains unchanged by definition since it was published. So many, many people have all kinds of ideas about what they think codependency is, excuse me, but the reality is all it can be is how, what it was written in the 1980s until those authors go out and really recreate the field, which they have not done since that time, we have the model that they have. And that is a trauma-based model. That's what it is. Um, so the big four books were Claudia Black's It Will Never Happen to Me in 1982, uh, Robin Norwood's Women Who Love Too Much in 1985, Codependent No More by Melody Beatty in 1986, and Diagnosing and Treating Codependence, which was a really important one that came out in 1986. 
the reason that uh, Tim Cermak's book, uh, Diagnosing and Treating Codependence, is important is because he was an MD and he was involved with the DSM committee. And so he worked tireless, tirelessly for a number of years to try to get codependency into the DSM. So is codependency in the DSM? No. Has codependency ever, ever been in the DSM or seriously considered like in the appendix? No. Has codependency ever been in the ICD-11, which is the International Cold Diagnostic Code? No. So since this topic has never made it to the level after 35 years of a clinical diagnosis ever, anywhere, all it really can be is a pop culture notion. We don't have the research, we don't have the validation for it clinically, and we don't have a diagnosis. And you may not or may be fans of our diagnostic manuals, um, but I'll tell you, over time, they do tend to identify problems. And they've had a long time to identify this one, and they never have. And I can tell you there are reasons for it, and maybe we'll get to them in the talk, but they were right not to identify codependency in the DSM, I believe. So a little bit about Codependent No More, the big one, Melody Beatty's big book. Um, Codependent No More sold 11 million copies. That was a lot in 1986. And it was translated into 16 languages. Women bought 95% of these. And in fact, women buy 95% of all self-help book titles. I know I've written 10 self-help books and I know that men don't buy them. Um, and they continue to do so today. So who was the message of codependency for? Be less dependent, be more independent, focus on yourself, separate from, from the people who are dragging you down and go out, go out there and achieve. I don't think that was a message for men in the 1980s. I think that was a message for women and women ate it up because it was the right one for them at the time. As of 1990, this is four years after Codependent More, No More was written, there were since in those four years, there were 102 books, 102 books written with some form of the word codependency in the title. By the time I got to my dissertation in 2018, there were over 340 books. These are just the English language titles. 340 books with some kind of form of the word codependency in the title. And I ask you, which is the right book? We have 340 books on a topic that has never been a formal diagnosis. Is what I think of codependency the same as what you think it is and the person sitting next to you? I doubt it. How you would treat this and how someone else would treat this thing that we're not even sure what it is would be different for each one of us. And that's fine as we're clinicians in our office and we know what we're doing and, you know, or our treatment centers and we've had experience. But what about the young people? What about the KDACs and the early people in recovery who are, uh, who are becoming therapists and they only have a year or two of training? What are we teaching them about how to treat families and partners? Are we telling them that these families and partners have deep patholo pathology of their, own, of their own that they need to chase down and examine for years as in codependency? Because I'm not sure how productive that would be or has been so far. What are we teaching? And that's what matters to me, not what any of us think we know about what the, the times we've been through or the things we've learned. But what are we teaching our young? Because when we're long gone, they are going to be carrying the flag of how we do this treatment. And I think codependency is a false narrative. Neither codependence nor codependency have ever been the DSM or the ICD. No criteria-based diagnosis has ever been created. Despite a lot of pressure at the time in the 1980s and the early 90s, the research on codependency never validated these hypothetical beliefs. They don't exist. I don't care how famous the word it is. I don't care how many people think that they know what it means. It, in clinical terms, it does not exist. Now, we've always had in the DSM, in our descriptive manual, some form of something called pathological dependency. And that is the idea that I am so incapable of functioning in life that unless I am deeply leaning into you and depending on you all the time for everything, that I cannot function. That's not codependency. So the DSM had already identified that when someone's dependency with someone rises to the level of complete incapacitation, that yes, they would be described as having pathological dependency. It was and is the existing de definition for people who are profoundly dependent, de uh, profoundly dysfunctional due to relationship over dependency. But that's not what codependency is. That doesn't even describe co what we consider to be codependency. And that's the only diagnosis we have for over dependency in the DSM or any of the other guidelines. So 
I ask you, please, you wonderful clinicians who are listening to me, what has not been said under in codependency in the last 200 books? I pulled up the last few books on codependency over that had come out over the last few years. And I found Codependency Loves Me Not, 2014, Codependency for Dummies, 2015, The End of Codependency, 2016, Conquering Codependency, 2016, Dependency Recovery Guide, 2018. How long is this going to go on? How many books can we write on the same subject until we figure out that we don't know what it is and that we are writing and writing and writing, trying to define something that does not exist? And if we knew what it was, we wouldn't be doing so much writing about it. Nobody wants to hear another word about all the new stuff about codependency. Do you know I've had trouble selling this book called Moving Beyond Codependency because there are so many books about moving beyond your codependency that that's all anybody thinks it would be, is getting beyond your codependency as if codependency even existed. And according to our clinical literature, and I am a licensed clinician, it doesn't, and it never has. This sets my hair on fire that we are still looking for another version, another way, another, another, about the same word that was invented 30 years ago to somehow make it fit in a way that fixes, that mirrors our times. And the word and the, and the experience simply no longer, if it ever did, mirrors our times. Now, let me talk a little bit about what codependency is as I understood it to be. I, as I said, I did do some work on this, so I think I have a pretty good understanding of it. And basically what codependency says is, look, you have trauma in your life. And it's a theory that says because of your trauma that happened when you were young and dependent on others, that when you become dependent again on another human being as an adult, like a marital partner, that you will start acting out and repeating the trauma from your childhood into that relationship. And the basics sound something like this, that codependent people will unconsciously attach to people whose own needs will eventually exceed their own, and that will lead to a repetition of their own abandonment or neglect or whatever kind of trauma they had. Um, these caregiving codependents, by definition, are seen to be acting out their own early trauma-based low self-esteem, their desperate fear of abandonment and need for approval by trying to control and manage and rage and nag at the addictive uh, par partner. So they're caregiving for a troubled other in our world, by the way, and think about this, as a codependent, trying to help the person that I love and doing everything I can to make them well and giving my heart and soul to try to help them heal, that caregiving for a troubled other under the model of codependency is perceived as a character flaw. The word itself, codependency, evolved from an earlier phrase that Claudia Black had written about in the 70s called co-addiction. And I really like the phrase co-addiction because it speaks to the fact that there is a dynamic going on between the couple or the family and that it is directly related to the addictive problem. It doesn't say I'm addicted to the person, and which is the problem with codependency. Codependency says, I'm addicted to my husband. I'm addicted to my wife. I'm addicted to my kids. I don't believe that you can be addicted to a person. I simply do not believe that's possible. I think you can be addicted to the idea of something, but I don't think you'd be actually addicted to the person. But what Claudia Black was writing about in the late 70s, I really liked, because basically what she said, something I agree with, which is that the addict gets completely obsessed with their alcohol, let's say, and then the partner also gets obsessed with the alcohol. And this goes along with what Al-Anon says about pouring liquor down drains and looking in closets. And they understood way back in Al-Anon, before codependency ever came along, that the, uh, the, the partner of an addict is obsessed with their using, with their drinking, with their gambling, not with them. Because if I was in mar married to you and in love with you and things were going well, I wouldn't be obsessed with anything. But when things go wrong and it's because of your drinking, I'm obsessed with the fact that you're drinking. And that's what upsets me. So I am not addicted to you, the person. I'm co-addicted with you to the alcohol. And that I can absolutely, uh, that absolutely makes sense to me. Although I would not, honestly not say that partners are in, in any way addicted. I would say that they are obsessed with someone else's drinking and using. And why are they obsessed with their husbands or their sons or their daughters drinking and using? Um, because it's ruining their life. Because they're watching a loved one go down the drain and they can't do anything about it. Imagine if your partner had cancer and you were watching them slip away every single day and there was nothing you could do 
you would nag, you would complain, you would gain weight, you would be miserable, you would read every book on the subject, because that's what we do when people we deeply love and are hurting are in crisis. We put ourselves aside. And I consider that to be an extraordinarily deep sign of health, that people show up for troubled people and stand by them with the hope that they will get better. And to me, that whole concept just shoves codependency out the window because I don't want my addicts, family members moving away from them unless there's profound abuse. I want them moving toward them with love and empathy and compassion and all their feelings about what's happened. Oh, there was something else in that slide I wanted to say. Hold on a second. Okay, guess not. So what's wrong with codependency? Why don't I like this label? Why do I think it needs to change? Well, number one, it's highly analytic. It looks at, it's like we're in an analysis class. It's like, well, what happened with your mom and then your dad and your relationship with them and the early attachment is gonna play out. There's a lot of analytic thinking in all of that. And most of us, to be honest, are not coming from an analytic perspective. Trauma perhaps, but not analytic. This kind of uh, process, this exploration in early assessment and treatment for these, I would say addiction survivors, they're surviving the addiction in another one. What's required under codependency, it tends to alienate them because it exacerbates, it raises these partners and family members' fears when you do codependency, that somehow they're responsible for the problem. And their feelings are quite human and non-pathological. I don't think there's anything wrong with giving your life to someone you love who's failing. I don't think there's anything wrong with giving of yourself to someone you love who's struggling. And when you tell someone, oh, gee, you know, you shouldn't have done that, what was wrong with you for doing that? There's always the implication that if you hadn't been doing this, your husband or wife or son or daughter would have stopped using. There is absolutely the implication in codependency without question that somehow the partner can at times be responsible for someone else's drinking or using. And don't you understand, I'll say again, that no one is ever responsible for my drinking and using. You can make me miserable, you can make me mad, you can nag at me all day long, you can have sex with other people, you can leave. But the decision to drink, to use, to act out, whatever it is I do, that is mine alone as an addict. I can choose to divorce you. I can get a marital counselor. I can go horseback riding. I can volunteer for something. There's a lot of things I can do in an unhappy relationship, but, uh, but um, start drinking, using, and making everybody miserable. That's my choice. And it doesn't matter what my partner does. I can simply leave my partner. If I don't like what they're doing, I don't have to drink. That's my choice. Loved ones of partner, loved ones of addicts tend to get angry when they're, and they're angry and they're confused when they enter treatment with, a, with an addict because they don't understand why so much attention is being placed on their dysfunction. Because you see partners and family members, they feel like, and I think it's often the true, that they've been the most functional one all along. I mean, this person's drinking and getting DUIs and falling flat on their face. Their partner has three jobs and is trying to keep everything afloat. Granted, personally, they're not doing so well, but they've been a hero to their family. And why would you start to look at their dysfunction, their over caregiving, when all they've been doing is trying to rescue their family? You're certainly not being in my field, what we call being where the client is. That client believes he or she has done their absolute best to try to make the family better. And they're so relieved that their loved one is finally getting treatment. And instead of supporting them and saying, good for you, you finally survived this and got them here. We say, now it's a good time to look at what's wrong with you. And they hate that. The codependency's models early focus on quickly engaging struggling people who have an active or newly sober addict in their life with a deep exploration of their own past, their own part, their own history, and their own problems. It's counterproductive to keeping them in treatment. I have seen many a family member say, oh, wait a minute, you're going to tell me that I'm part of the problem here? Well, that's not the family week I came for, and I'm leaving, and they did. And I've seen that. And then the treatment team, of course, embracing their model fully says, oh, that poor dear, she's codependent. He just, she just couldn't handle the lecture. Well, maybe it wasn't the right lecture. Maybe it's time for this field to stand up and say, the model we've been using isn't right. And there's other ways to do this work better. The clinical frame that codependency is held within views desperate, loving partners and family members of addicts and the mentally ill, who I believe are just trying their best to get through the day, 
It views them as enabling difficult people whose own problems are getting in the way of their own healing and of healing a loved one. What a lovely viewpoint to have of someone before they even come in your office. How did we ever get to have a prejudice about people before they walk in our offices? How many of you have been told or assumed or learned that if someone's married to an alcoholic or a, a drug addict, they're codependent by nature? Who do we ever say has a disease without working with them, uh, understanding them, and certainly we would never diagnose them when they're in a crisis? So this idea that we would call them anything, borderline, anything more than disrupted by a crisis is judgmental. And do you think there's never, ever been a drug addict or an alcoholic who was married by some, let me try it this way. Do you think there was never, ever someone ever who married a drug addict and alcoholic who wasn't codependent, who didn't have a trauma history? I bet you there are. I bet you there are people who just fell in love with some of us and married us and the addiction showed up later. I bet that's true. But unfortunately, the way we look at this field, if you are involved deeply with an addict or uh, with an addict, then you are codependent by definition. And that shows no interest or focus on the person as an individual themselves. Codependency assumes that the client, the partner, or the family member, they're going to have many, many sessions. They're going to be able to therapy a few times a week and read books and work on themselves because this was a pro, this was a concept that was developed in the 1980s when we had lots of insurance and people had our lives weren't as crazy and busy. And thus the model was written where people would be going to lots of therapy and be journaling and learning about themselves. In 2021, most people do not have the finances, the insurance, the ability, the time, the interest, or the motivation to attend, to attend long-term therapy. And I say to you, to you therapists, I know that our goal always when someone's in a crisis is to try to help them come out of that crisis doing a little better than they did before when they went in. But there is nothing wrong with having someone come back out of their crisis and do just as well as they did before. Not everybody wants to grow. Not everyone wants to self-actualize. And I think it's intrusive of us to try to assume that they do. So how did the field get here? How did we get to this um, kind of blaming, shaming, a pre-articulated view of partners? Um, and I wanna give you a few examples, a little, bit, a little bit of that. I think I've got some time for this. So in fact, I'm watching my time, I do. So how do we get here? Well, first of all, what entered the addiction field in the 1950s was systems theory. And we started to look at family systems as a system and we start, and there were kind of two ways this could have gone. This could have gone in the way that it did, which is that all family members are part of this destructive system and each family member has a part to play in, in enabling and supporting the addiction. And all family members have a part to play in keeping the addiction going forward. That is how systems theory uh, resolved the question of um, what is going on in this system with the alcoholic. I think they got it wrong because there was another option. The other option was that these were reasonably healthy, kind, healthy, happy family until someone's disease, their alcoholism made the family dysfunctional. And that person got worse and worse and worse and they're getting DUIs and they're not picking up their kids at school and they disappear for a few days at, at a time. And the family goes into crisis because one of the primary members of that family is in crisis and they're not, it's not resolving. So everybody else starts to act like a trauma survivor, go into earlier forms of functioning, regress, which is what we do under crisis. And, and everybody starts running around and nagging and fixing and complaining, all the stuff we do when there's a crisis that we don't know how to fix. And instead of being supported for the challenges that are going through the crisis, as I believe they should be, they more get finger pointed and challenged because systems theory ended up with this idea that everyone in the family is supporting the addiction rather than everyone in the family is being affected by the addiction, which is how I would look at it. In the 1980s, we got early trauma theory, theory and then for those of you around, it was trauma, 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 trauma. And while we do have a more sophisticated view and a very important view of trauma today, at the time, some of you may remember, it was simply about, boy, people got a lot of trauma and a lot of pain. We just got to help them get it out. They got to get it out. They got to beat their hands on beds and throw things and scream and get out that trauma. And of course, they often got back home after treatment worse than they were when they started. Because back then we didn't understand that it wasn't enough to recognize the pain. It was, it was just equally as important to learn how to contain it. 
we didn't have EMDR, we didn't have somatic, we didn't have a DBT, we didn't have ways to help people make sense of and contain what was coming up for them. And so people went into treatment because we were pushing, pushing a trauma, they came out worse than when they started. But one of the things we looked at was, you know, what is the trauma survival, how do trauma survivors act and what kind of behaviors do they show? And we noticed that there were people who didn't have PTSD, but had had horrible marriages, horrible childhood experiences, and they showed similar symptoms to people with PTSD. And we started realizing, oh, there are adults walking around in America who have trauma and here's how we know, look at their symptoms. So that was a very hot topic in the 1980s. In the 60s, 70s, and 80s, we got humanistic psychotherapy, which pulled us out of um, analysis. It pulled us out of behaviorism and pulled us more into the world we live in now, uh, the world where the focus of healing is self-actualization um, and a lot about self-examination. And the goal of humanistic psychotherapy to be looking at someone's strengths and how they can become a stronger, better person rather than looking at their pathology. By the way, out of humanistic psychotherapy came all of these self-help seminars that we did in the 80s and 90s like EST and LifeSpring and Insight. And they were all places, you guys may not know this, where bunches of us, of us would go to an auditorium for two or three days and we would grow and we would develop and we would consciousness raise. And really that was sort of the public um, expression of this deeper movement of self-actualization that was going on in the field of psychotherapy in the 90s, in the early 2000s. Certainly the most profound piece, of the, in my opinion, that pushed codependency to the fore, that made it the pop culture notion that it is, was the women's movement. Because if you think about what was going on in the early, late 1970s, right before codependency came along, the women's rights amendment had just failed. And women had to go back into the workplace without any real rights, than they, any more real rights than they'd had in the 1960s when they were typing on, on the typewriters and saying, yes, sir. Only now in the 1980s, women wanted to break through the glass ceiling and they wanted to succeed. And there was no way in the 1980s that a woman who was dependent on a man, responding to a man, looking up to a man, trying to get his approval, trying to get him to notice her, there was no way that that method was gonna get a woman ahead. The concept in part related to feminism was you gotta knock that guy out of the box. You gotta be smarter and faster and move quicker and get him out of the way. And if you wanna see an example of that in 1980, you go see the movie Nine to Five, where you have three women in 1980, Dolly Parton, uh, well, Dolly Parton Jane Fonda, and um, Lily Tomlin. And there they all are smart, intelligent women who realize they're smarter than their bosses, but he's the one who's in charge. And the movie is about how to get around him to be able to express their talents. Women were not interested in depending on men or looking up to men in the 1980s. They wanted to get away from men and be independent. This idea of depending deeply on a man for your emotional support and connection was not what women wanted in the 1980s. And they bought codependency books by the handful. And it was the right message for them at the time. Don't depend on men, do it for yourself. You can go girl, go girl, and you don't need men to support you. And in many ways, that was an extraordinarily, extraordinarily helpful um, piece of information and language for women who were trying to achieve in the world, not so useful at home. When you wanna be vulnerable, when you wanna be open with someone, when you want to let them in. Here's a little bit of Melody Beatty from the, word, the book Codependent No More. And I'll, I think as you read along with me, you'll see some of what I'm talking about. So this is for women, for sure. And Melody said, stop centering and focusing on other people. Settle down and in ourselves. Stop seeking so much approval and validation from others. We don't need the approval of everyone and anyone. We only need our own approval. We have the same sources for happiness and making choices inside of ourselves that others do. So find and develop your own internal supply of peace, well-being, and self-esteem. Relationships help, but they cannot be our source. Now, when I look at this from the model of codependency in 1986, women needing to not be dependent to find their own approval, to find their own deep inner resources and supply of well-being, I think of that was a great message for women at that time. But right now, in the psychotherapy world, we are much less focused on self-actualization, individual actualization, and much more on connection. 
Today, we look at attachment and connection as meaningful as my success in the world. I can be handsome, good looking, talented, have a wonderful business and everything is going right. But if my attachments and my relationships are not sound, well, then I'm not healthy because I'm only really as healthy as the quality of my relationships. We say that in the, in the, in the 2000s. So to say that I don't need approval from others is untrue. We know that we really need approval and it's really important to get it. And to allow, allow ourselves to be needful and vulnerable and ask for it is really important. To say we only need our own approval is simply untrue. To say that relationships help, but they cannot be our source is completely untrue. Because we all know that those of us in intimate loving relationships, the research tells us we live longer, we're more successful, we're happier. Um, all of the metrics for a good life fall inside of living and enjoying a healthy partnership. Now, single people do pretty well and you guys enjoy your lives and people who are unhappy in a relationship do about as well as single people. But if you're a married or committed person in a relationship and you're loving that person, they're loving you, you're gonna live longer and be healthier. So clearly we are meant to depend on each other, to lean into each other. You know, um, I have to tell you guys this, I was in Arizona a couple of years ago at some coffee shop. And I looked out the window in the desert and there were two people walking toward me. It was a little miragey. I couldn't see who they were. They were older. But what I can see was I could see two people with short white hair and both people with green t-shirts and tan shorts and flip-flops. And they were walking toward the restaurant. And it wasn't until they were about 50 feet away that I realized which one was the woman and which was the man. And, you know, I spoke to them for a little bit, just, hi, how are you? Welcome. And what they told me, well, we've been fit married for 50 years. And I thought, this is the right thing. I want to be the guy who after 50 years with someone, we start dressing alike, we start talking alike, we start finishing each other's sentences. That's not codependency, that's love. That's intimacy. That's a powerful connection with another person if it doesn't impede my success, but rather supports it. Why in the world would I consider myself to be my own best friend as opposed to, I mean, that's fine, I am, but by being a good friend to myself is by leaning into others and making sure I have their support all the time. This is the piece I think that codependency missed is how much we need each other. Prayer and meditation and being able to tolerate your feelings on your own is fine. But the ability to reach out to other people and let them know what you're feeling and get their support is beautiful. Was this message from Melody Beatty a message for men in the 1980s? I'm afraid not. We were watching Top Gun. We already knew who was in charge, what women wanted, who was on top. We were not worried about, about dependency. But this was a siren song to women of the period. Think of nine to five. The message was climb right over that asshole boss sister, break through that glass ceiling, get him out of the way because you don't need him. But sadly, I don't think that's independence. That's it. That's not interdependence. That's not you go, then I go, then you go and supporting each other. This is anti-dependence. This message of I don't need you, I can do it myself, I'll post myself by the bootstrap, bootstraps, I don't need to lean into a man, is really anti-dependence. And I would like to say that I think a lot of marriages could have survived the 1990s. Alcoholic marriages, affair-based marriages, had this view of relationships are everything, hold on to them if you can, been in place, as opposed to you'll do better if you separate and focus on yourself. So what's changed since 1982 is the entire field of psychotherapy. Our focus now is not so much on on um, individual self-actualization, a la Bill Clinton, that I can be the most intelligent, smartest, most achieved person in the world. Because as you know from his example, that doesn't mean you're particularly emotionally involved. Our focus in mental health and addiction since the 1980s has turned from self-actualization as a measure of health and success to our health being viewed equally in terms of the strength of our attachments, our relationships, our pair bonds, our family, our peer and community relationships. Today, I am as strong as my connections. Today, I do not have to be the best me that I can be by myself, which I think actually is kind of a, a, a individualistic, narcissistic stance. It kind of leads into the me generation kind of thinking, which is I have to be the best me I can be. 
I think that we can actually grow and maintain and become the best family members we can be, the best workplace members we can be, the best community members we can be by focusing on relationship and focusing on, on healthy dependency rather than turning away from it. The me generation has moved on, and I think our treatment methods, especially codependency, needs to move on. What I'm supposed to do in codependency treatment is help someone understand their own trauma history and why they chose the person they're with and why they've stayed with this person and why they're making their problem worse. I need them to understand the unproductive ways in which their history is playing out in their current relationship and thus inadvertently enabling the addiction. I have to help them acknowledge the ways that they are acting out their own unresolved issues or worse today which is making everything worse in their life especially because of their incessant caregiving, enabling, enmeshing, manipulating, nagging, and threatening, and all that stuff. All of that is just acting out their past. Because what they really need to do, says codependency, is detach, set boundaries, focus on themselves, and establish distance from the addict. Now, some of you might say, and you do, especially those of you who've been practiced for 15, 20 years, you're going to say, but Dr. Rob, nobody does codependency treatment in that way anymore. What I do is way different. And I would say to you, okay, what do you, which one of the 340 books on codependency is the most useful version of the work that you do? Since the model of codependency has never, ever been formalized as a clinical diagnosis, what are you teaching your students about it? Where is the proof and the research behind which we are teaching people things? In what paradigm and research is the work that you're doing with partners and family members based? Is the way you work with such family members of alcoholics and addicts documented clearly so we can properly educate new professionals? In other words, if you have a new, new path, a different way than you do it, have you written it down, done some research on it, and put it out there as I'm doing with pro-dependence? Where did you learn to do the work that you do with families and partners? In my belief system, a rose is a rose is a rose. Um, we have, we can revise old ways of looking at things. We can adapt previously formalized treatment models, but you can't originally, you can't eliminate their original intent. To eliminate their original intent is to eliminate the concept and rewrite it. And the original intent of codependency was to look at someone's early trauma history and see how, it, how it's playing out in their adult life. And my belief is when someone's in a crisis around the potential loss of a meaningful family partner to addiction, that's not the time when they need to be looking at their past, their history, or anything that happened to them. They have enough of a crisis facing them right in the mirror and in their lives every day. All of the founding codependency literature all 341 books, <laughs> places trauma repetition at the core of a loved one's response to addiction. And therefore it asks trauma repetition in the partner or the family member to be the core focus of their early assessment and treatment. Notice that partners don't get validated for the hard work they've given. They don't get supported for all the hours that they put in counting bottles and waiting for that person to go home and picking them up at bars. They don't get validated for working three jobs and trying to keep the family alive. All we give partners from the beginning is, other than I'm sorry this is happening to you, is let's look at your part in it and what's wrong with you. No wonder why their treatment often fails. So, as I said, I did a PhD on this topic. I want to give you just a little slide, not a lot, I promise, about a little bit of the research I did. And what I did was I gathered together 68 senior therapists, all of whom said that they had had um, significant training or supervision in the addictions and in codependency. And I asked them a whole series of questions about how they work with codependency, how they view it, and all that kind of stuff. And it was from that that I formulated my uh, my hypothesis and, and wrote and eventually wrote pro-dependence. And so I thought this was an interesting question, so I wanted to include it for you. My question was, to what degree do you think of or conceptualize the partner or a loved one of an addict, so the wife, a husband, a, a mom, to what degree do you think of them as being in the midst of a personal crisis in their first 60 days of therapy? 
So they come to see you, they got an active addict in their life or an addict who's just going into treatment, they've just started with you and it's about those issues. How many of you believe they're having a personal crisis? And 66% very, said very likely and then 16% said likely. So by the time you get to um, somewhat likely, likely and very likely, we're in the 80% mark. That something like 80 something percent of you said that the people who come in who are loving an addict and they're coming in for their own help are coming in in a crisis. And I was so grateful that you told me this because it gave me the whole foundation for the model of pro-dependence. I'm sorry, 90, I was close, 91% of those therapists said that the person coming into treatment is a crisis, is in crisis. So that made it very easy for me to think about what is the right thing to do with partners and families of addicts when they come into treatment. I'm not talking about a year from that or six years from that or even six months, but I'm talking in the beginning of their care when they have an active addict in their lives or someone who's in early recovery, what is the focus of our treatment and how do we know that it's the right thing? And I'm suggesting you that the right thing for them is crisis counseling. Because someone who's got an active addict in their life or is just getting that person to treatment, I promise you they're in crisis and they've been in a crisis for a long time. And we know that people in crisis, there are certain criteria we have as therapists for their treatment. We know that a person in crisis can only hear so much on one end and can only take in and act on so much on the other. So when we do crisis counseling, we have certain things that we focus on and certain things we absolutely avoid. I reviewed probably for my PhD, six or eight different forms of crisis counseling. And I put them together in um, a standard format, pulling from all of them because they're all basically the same. And this is what the crisis counseling method that I looked up says. When someone's in a crisis, this is what's going on. And I want you to think of the partners and the family members of the addicts that you know. Crisis is a state of emotional turmoil or an acute emotional reaction to a powerful stimulus or demand. Two, these are the characteristics of a crisis. The usual balance between my thinking and my emotions is disturbed. So for partners and family members, they're usually all in their emotional selves, oh my God, and blah, 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 and they're usually way in the emotional place. And addicts, by the way, are often way too intellectual with, well, I didn't mean to do this, but I sort of meant to do that, and I kind of looked at it this way, and they're way too much in their heads. So both of these sets of people, by the way, are in crisis. Um, but one of the aspects of crisis that is significant, especially for the partners and family members, is that how they usually cope has failed. So in other circumstances where they had a miscarriage, let's say, they got counseling, they started exercising, they started going to church, they joined the choir, they were hanging out with other moms once a week. They found a plan and a platform to cope with the loss of that child they were going to have, and they got through it. But in this kind of addiction, this kind of disorder, it's not unusual that the coping mechanisms we, which we have, which is to try to influence our partner to doing things differently or, or yell or scream or shout to let them know what's going wrong, they're not listening. And the way that I'm trying to soothe and cope, which is by calming myself down and understanding that things are getting better or detaching from the problem for a while to take care of myself, those aren't really good solutions in this situation because that person needs my help. When there is a crisis, there's evidence of impairment in an individual or family. So the balance between thinking and emotions is disturbed. The person's usual coping mechanisms have failed and they're floundering around. And there's evidence of impairment in themselves or their family. That's all it takes to define a crisis. I think if I were washing your hands, every one of you would be putting up your hand. Yes, all my partners and family members of active addicts are going through that. Now hear this, crisis intervention methods, the work that we do with people in crisis, is meant to provide help um, dur during in a period of extreme distress. It's not meant to be thought of as lifelong or analytic or we're gonna be doing this for years. It's about hel helping the person get through the crisis. And let me tell you when I think a crisis is over, when you're involved with an alco alcoholic addict or maybe someone who's bipolar, the crisis is over when they're stable when the bipolar is on their meds, when the addict has stopped using and is going to meetings, you, the crisis is over. Um, when you have left this person because you can't live with them anymore and they're not getting better, the crisis is over. But while that person is still in this 
partner or loved one's life actively using the crisis continues. So to begin to examine or look at or get underneath the, 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 the uh, rug of what's going on with the partner is completely inappropriate while they're in crisis. And while they're in crisis, it's going to go along as long, going to go on as long as the addiction is active or they are still involved with this person. So you could be doing crisis modality treatment for a long time until that person gets sober. Um, now, what is crisis counseling? I looked again, as I said, multiple uh, multiple different arenas where it was being practiced, and I pretty much got the same definition. Number one, and I really want you to think about what we ask people to think about in codependency treatment, what we ask them on assessment, and what this is saying. So crisis counseling, which I believe absolutely is what partners and family members, members of addicts need in the beginning. They say, keep it simple. In a crisis, people do not respond best or do respond best to simple procedures. Simple things have the best chance of having a positive effect. So trying to explain somebody a complex analytic model that involves trauma and their part in it and how it's being played out in their adult life is not keeping things simple. In the groups that I've been in, in the treatment centers where they do codependency, it takes a week for us to just get the partners to understand codependency and then they have to buy into it and it's a model that doesn't make them feel good and doesn't innately feel right. So it's difficult to, to begin with. Psychological crisis counseling must be brief and clear. Psychological first aid needs to remain short. So with partners I would, uh, and family members, I would be doing short focused sessions with a lot of check-ins, a lot of here and now, a lot of, okay, you said you were gonna to go to the gym, check in with me after, make sure you did. Lots of socialization and support and activities. Um, but I wouldn't ask them to journal for three weeks. I wouldn't ask them to go to a week long workshop on betrayal because they need to get their feet back from under them in the real world. And they need to start walking around and figuring out how their life's gonna work. If you push people into trauma work or early childhood work or deep self-examination while they're in a crisis, they're going to unravel or at least they're gonna deeply doubt themselves in ways that make them less helpful to the situation that's going on in front of them. Under crisis counseling treatment, we are asked to provide useful, concrete direction and support. The suggestions we offer should be simple, practical, as impractical suggestions can cause the person to feel more frustrated and thus out of control. Did I, Dr. Rob Weiss, write that? No. Some uh, the, the crisis counseling people did. Is it, does it prove my point absolutely? For sure. I do not want to do anything with a freaked out partner of an addict of some kind when they're still using or on the way to treatment by giving them complex homework, workshops, things to think about. I just want to help them get through the day. Crisis counseling requires me, very important for codependency, pushing it aside. Crisis counseling works in the here and now. How are you getting through the day? What are you going to do tonight if you find a bottle at home? What are you going to do this afternoon if, how are you going to get to some yoga? How are you going to get to some massage? It's all about how can you take care of yourself and get through the situation in the here and now. Clients who are in a crisis, they do not have the psychological sophistication to engage in in-depth clinical evaluations or discussions of their past. Remain focused on the problems at hand. And what I would say to you is, when I if I'm doing an assessment of a partner or a family member of an addict or someone who's mentally ill, I don't ask them much about their childhood at all in the beginning, because to ask them about their childhood is to imply to them, what is your part in this? And whether they have a part or they don't have a part, I don't want them to think they have a part in it. So I'm not gonna ask them about their history in the first couple of sessions, because it immediately leads to the thought of, well, if you're asking me about how I grew up, you're already going to tell me that I had a part in this person's drinking and I need to figure it out and examine it. And that makes them furious, hurt, embarrassed, and let down. And most of all, it's not focusing on the problem. 
they've got a drunk at home. They've got three kids at home where and dad just went into treatment and they've got pressing immediate problems in front of them that they need to deal with work in the here and now with these folks and offer hope. So much of what I do all day long is hold hope for other people I know. And by the way, a lot of people don't want to come to treatment because they'll say to me, you know what, ultimately, I don't want to fail. I don't want to go to treatment because I think I'll fail. I'm, I'll lose one more time. I'll drink or use one more time. I'm not going to get this. And so why try? I can't tell you how important hope is all the way around, both for addicts who seem um, uh, what's the word, who seem like they're pushing back against the process, but often it's because they're afraid of failure. And addicts who, and partners who have lost all hope that things are ever going to get better because they've been bad for so long, um, we need to hold them up and say, you know, with the right kind of care, things can get better. These are the kinds of things that I focus on when I'm working with partners and family members of addicts. So I've spent a number of years bringing and writing a new paradigm for you called pro-dependence. I'm going to go get the book for a second. Hold on. I actually have a copy of it here, and that was something I wanted to read to you from it. Um, let me just say one thing to you about pro-dependence. Um, it has become a movement around the world. I wrote the pro-dependence book in the fall of 2018. And there are now self-running pro-dependence groups for women experiencing an addict uh, in Singapore, in Minneapolis, and in London. Uh, so I know that by simply going in and teaching people about this has left them shoving codependency to the curb and wanting to band together in groups to begin to talk about the positive nature of their loving and how it has brought good and how it continue to bring, can continue to bring good. So, Prodependence came out in the fall of 2018. The paradigm looks like this. When the spouse of a loved one or an active addict, when the spouse or loved one of an ad active addict or a mentally ill person walks into my office, I see them as someone in the midst of a profound life crisis, which is not of their own making, and one that anyone would have little ability to solve on their own. By definition, these partners and family members have been victimized. And I use that word on purpose because I know how not a negative word is in the addiction community, but this is the truth. By definition, these partners and family members have been victimized by repeated betrayals around, I won't do this, or I wasn't there, or it's not what I said, or all the crap that addicts do. They betray and victimize their family members every single time they lie. And these are also people with whom they share a deep and trusting bond. So their son, their lover, their wife is lying consistently, and that is a form of victimization to them. The trust that I have in my loved one is really never broken because of my drinking, my using, my gambling, my sexing, whatever the behavior is, that is deeply saddening and hurtful to my partner. It doesn't so much make them angry. What makes them angry and what's really puts our relationship on the line is the lack of trust that we share. Because if I'm an active addict and I'm in your life, I'm lying to you about where I spend money, how I spend my time, where I go, what I do, and you don't believe anything I say, nor should you. But, but it is the lying and the manipulation and the seduction and the gaslighting that nearly all addicts employ in order to keep doing what we want to do that devastates our partners because they lose their ability to see reality clearly. When a partner says to me, I know you said you were going to be home at 6.30, didn't you, to fix dinner? And I say, no, 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 eight o'clock. Remember, I never said 6.30, but I did say 6.30. It's just that I wanted that hour and a half to go buy some drugs. And then I tell my spouse, no, no, it was eight o'clock. They're going to doubt themselves. They're going to say, well, maybe it was eight o'clock. And in that way, I make them crazy by mixing up reality in order to suit uh, my needs as an addict. I can make my partners crazy. And that breaks their trust. I strongly believe that people in the midst of a profound life crisis, like living with or loving an alcoholic or a mentally ill person, need crisis counseling 
not analysis, not exploration, not evaluation or, in, or interventions, as these experiences often feel blaming, intrusive, painful, counterintuitive, and distracting to that person who's just trying to figure out uh, what truck just hit them. In this paradigm of pro-dependence, what I've created is a, an attachment focused, not trauma focused, an attachment focused theory of human dependency that says that those who partner with a troubled person, an addict, a mentally ill person, are no more and no less than loving people who are caught up in circumstances that have gotten beyond their ability to cope. That maybe there's nothing wrong with me or you attaching to a troubled person until that person's trouble exacerbates and we don't know how to help them. That's when we go into crisis. Moreover, a person's desire to help an addict, to love an addict, to support an addict, and all, A-L-L, -L, related actions engaged toward helping an addict, useful or not, that all of that demonstrates nothing more than a normal and healthy attempt to remain attached to a failing loved one while simultaneously facing extraordinarily difficult circumstances. So I'm gonna give you an example of this. It's a, such an antithesis of CODA uh, message that I wanna give it. So let's say I work with a woman whose husband is an alcoholic and he drinks all day and he has been driving drunk with the kids and he's lost three jobs and he's gotten two DUIs. And she makes an agreement with him and she says, honey, you can drink all you want. In fact, I'm gonna have a cold bottle of vodka sitting on the dining room table every night when you come home at four o'clock. But during the day, you ain't driving because you gotta keep that job. You gotta bring my kids home sober and I don't want you getting a DUI. And once you get home and the, I have the keys to the car, you can do what you want. Now I can only imagine and have heard what someone who's in AA or, or CODA would say about this enabling, bringing bottles home, maintaining her trauma. I just don't see it that way. To me, the word that comes up most strongly, the phrase is harm reduction. This woman came to me because after two years of her husband drinking at night, but taking care of all of his daytime responsibilities sober, he started drinking again in the daytime. And that meant that she needed more help. She was not able to get him stop, to stop drinking two years ago, but she was able to make her family more functional by getting this guy to work and drive and with their kids without him being impaired. And I think, wow, that was really clever of her. She wasn't trying to re-engage trauma. She wasn't trying to find a way to be able to go to work and have her kids get to work and come home and not have there be a crisis every day. And I say good on her. Prodependence is a treatment lens through which we view partners and loved ones of addicts and the mentally ill much more compassionately than we have before because the only thing, the only reason we see them as going crazy is because the love that they have is failing right in front of their eyes. The person that's most important to them is slipping through their fingers and no matter what they do, they can't make it better. And so they nag louder and they complain louder and they yell louder and they revert into their own trauma because the person they love is fading away and they can't make it better. You would go crazy too. Prodependence as I've created is not a label. It's not a pathology. It's a theory of relationships that says basically that two troubled people who are attempting to heal together are stronger in their healing than someone trying to heal on their own. I don't believe that couples are best served by going, by separating and going off into their own corners and maybe at some point re-engaging. I think there needs to be engagement at some level, even if it's just setting boundaries at the beginning, all the way along for the couple. And the, the meaning of the love and the relationship that these people have to for each other and have always had for each other needs to have equal weight as the addiction, if not more so. Prodependence recognizes, I get it, when some caregivers actions run off track and they're doing something that's really counterproductive to healing, well, then we just put them back on track. We don't look at the history of their family and everything's ever happened to them to see why they're yelling at somebody. We just tell them it would be best if you didn't yell. <laughs> and if you feel like yelling, do this. We're just trying to help them get through this without having to take a deep dive into those psychological history. It's not going to help them. 
Prodependence does not imply on any level that a caregiver's dysfunctional behaviors of any kind arise, sorry, basically, pro, sorry, I didn't say this right. Prodependence implies that if a caregiver giver seems like they're doing kind of crazy behaviors with an addicted partner, that doesn't mean it comes out of trauma. It may simply mean it comes out of what's happening in the moment. My belief system, to treat loved ones of addicts and the mentally ill using pro-dependence. I do not need to find anything wrong with a partner or a spouse. This is a strength-based model. I want to acknowledge the trauma and the inherent dysfunction that comes from living with an active addict over time. And then I want to validate, support, and cheer for that spouse or that family member who's been able to hang in there despite how difficult it is. Do you know where any of us would be if there weren't people who hung in there with us when we were difficult, when we were using, when we were mentally ill, when we were struggling? Don't you think the people who stuck by you when you were at your worst were your friends and your heroes? Or would you just say they were enabling troubled people? I don't think so. What I try to do now and I can't... Hold on. This is a little clip from Johanna Hari and it is you know, really part of the shifting views of how we look at addiction. He is not talking, by the way, about enabling someone and just sitting around while they destroy themselves. But what he is talking about is not backing away and saying to someone, because you're using, I'm not gonna be in your life. Because I think the person who's using needs us in their life more when they're using than when they're not, even though they say they don't. So this is a beautiful little cut from a TED talk by Johanna Hari who's in England, talking about um, addiction being the opposite of connection. What I try to do now, and I can't tell you I do it consistently, and I can't tell you it's easy, is to say to the addicts in my life that I want to deepen the connection with them, to say to them, I love you, whether you're using or you're not. I love you, whatever state you're in. And if you need me, I'll come and sit with you, because I love you, and I don't want you to be alone or to feel alone. And I think... The core of that message, you're not alone, we love you, has to be at every level of how we respond to addicts, socially, politically, and individually. For a hundred years now, we've been singing war songs about addicts. I think all along we should have been singing love songs to them, because the opposite of addiction is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is connection. And. Uh... Just to reinforce that, when we work with mentally ill people and we drag them out of their isolated apartment or, off, uh, or under a cardboard box on the street, what do we do? We bring them to a hospital, a medication program, someplace, and we pair them with people. The first thing we do with troubled people after we assess them is we throw them in a group. And when you've got addicts, what is the most important piece of their healing? Being in the group. Um, it is socializing and connecting and integrating people into connection that creates healing, not distancing, not separation. Um, yes, people have to separate distance for self-care, but when they walk back into their relationship, I can love my husband or wife just as much as I ever love them, even when they're using, because I understand that I am not responsible for it and I cannot fix it. All I can do is sit by them and help them. And that takes a lot of the weight and the anger and the hurt off of my shoulders. This whole idea that if you were, look, if you loved me, you would stop drinking in some way speaks to codependency because it doesn't matter how much I love you. I'm drinking because drinking is the most important thing in my life and love has nothing to do with it. And yet a partner will react like it's part of how they're being felt about. Those are the kinds of things that we can split apart and work on in treatment, rather than talking about how your grandmother died when you were seven. So I say to my therapist friends, please work on this. I have sat in so many, remember I've been involving treatment centers and residential treatment for addiction for 25 years. I have sat in so many med rooms with other therapists who are saying, oh my God, I can't believe that woman isn't getting it. She's such a co, or that mom is sicker than her kid. She won't let him go. Or I worry about that, about her going home with her brother. He's such a rescuer. Or that wife is so focused on his drinking, she just won't see her part. Well, what if she doesn't have a part? 
What if someone you're calling a born rescuer is just a guy who loves his sister? And what kind of mom would ever let her child go? So I want you to pay attention to the things you say, because we have this idea, and I felt this a long time, that codependency is this golden model that we found, it's a miracle we found it, and now we know what to do with all these partners. Of course, it doesn't really work and it angers them, but everyone must fit into this model, even though it's never been validated, never been a diagnosis, never really been approved, but it is a huge pop culture notion, so it must be right. And we therapists have been blaming clients for not fitting into our model for 20 years, and that makes me furious. It's not our job to get clients to fit our model. It's our job to follow the client and see where they are and how we can help them in what they're dealing with. Maybe our model will work, maybe it won't, but the client is first, not the model. So I say to you, what if the loved ones of addicts and family members of the mentally ill aren't so difficult to treat and the problem has lain more in how we have conceptualized them? What if our primary and sole family therapy method for helping such people, codependency, has left them feeling misunderstood, marginalized, confused, and more ashamed for the love they give than when they started? Why would you leave someone who's been loving and caring and giving of themselves utterly to a troubled person they love? Why would you ever leave that person doubting themselves at all? Why prejudge the loved one of an addict or a mentally ill person as codependent or anything? Why would you even want to look at them as the drivers of a dysfunctional system, as opposed to someone who's just trying to do their best to make it better, which is, I think, what they really are? What happens if your diagnosis of codependency or co whatever you want to call those partners, that kind of label we put on them, what if that pushes them into feeling misunderstood, defensive, and they leave treatment. Haven't we undermined our very goal, which is to help the family work through healing? Because I got to tell you, in case you didn't know, that addicts who have family members who are involved in their healing in an active way are far more successful at healing than people who, are, who don't have active family members in their lives when they're trying to heal. So why would we encourage detachment when we should encourage healthy connection? Why don't we focus on the strengths of the partners and the family members while also being where they are from day one. Do you know how strong someone must be to hang out and live by and live with a troubled person? Do you know how strong someone is to tolerate the pain and the unhappiness, but still hold on to the good they see in that person with the hope that maybe things will get better? I think those people, anyone can hold on to a vision of me at my best when you knew me when things were good and you're still holding on to that vision of me when I was good and healthy, I may be able to just find my way back into that vision and we can relive that, that life. And you may be the only one holding on to the good person that I was. What an incredible gift that partners and family members give us addicts. I believe, and I'm finishing up now, I believe that we can refocus all of the actions of a painful, hurting loved one through, the, through a strength-based attachment lens and literally reframe what we see as deficits in these partners as strengths. And I'm going to give you a list of the words. I think you'll like this. So I don't like these words on the left, these codependent, what I would call deficit-based words. And I'm much more interest, interested in strength-based language and looking at the achievements and the successes of someone in this difficult circumstance rather than what they did wrong. So I would never say to a partner, you're enmeshed. I would say you're deeply involved. Good for you. I would not say that you're only focused on that other person and not looking at yourself. I would say, boy, you've really good, got a good eye on what made your relationship fail, the addiction. I wouldn't say that you're enabling. I would say you're supporting. I wouldn't say that you're fearful. I would say you're concerned. I wouldn't say that you don't have any healthy boundaries. I would say you're eager to care for someone and you don't know how. I wouldn't say that you can't stop fixing this person. I would say you can, you'll do whatever you can do to help rescue and save the people you love because that's what we do. I'm not going to say you're living in denial. I think you as a partner know exactly what's going on. I think what's going on is you're unwilling to give up on someone you love. 
And I know that everybody, including yourself, sees you as controlling and nagging, but I think you're just terrified of further out of control losses that you can't stop. Um, some people will say that you're rageful and nagging and whining all the time. I think you're just trying to make things different in a situation where it doesn't seem to be working. And some people say, well, oh, you're so hypervigilant. Why wouldn't you be? You're anticipating the problems that you've already have and you've been having every time that door opens or closes. So why wouldn't you be hypervigilant? I think there are, we can take every one of these uh, criticisms and judgments of these partners and turn them into strengths that they have and the love that they give in an attachment-based model. So I'm almost done. Two more slides. What about their trauma history? Lord knows this woman comes in, she's married to this guy. She's got all this trauma and all these issues about her past. Let it wait. She's got a trauma right here in her life today. There is plenty of trauma to go around here and now if you love an active addict or a mentally ill person. Why not give someone who loves one of those folks, why not give them the grace to come to us, the therapists, when and if they are ever ready to self-explore and self-examine? Because to make people self-explore and self-examine without that being a goal of their own is intrusive. I can help people survive addiction and mental illness as a loving family member without asking them to do lengthy explorations of their own painful unconscious challenges. Now, all the things that at CODA has supported, I get, I fully believe in pro-dependent supports, self-care, boundaries, picking the right battles, asserting healthy anger, all those wonderful things over there and self-care. But we don't recommend all of this at the, on the altar of and sacrificing the intimate relationship. So really important slide, one of my favorites. How do addicts feel about codependency? Well, first of all, we love the responsibility for our problems that CODA puts on our spouses. We addicts love the fact that we can now turn to you on some level and say, well, you're so codependent, you nag so much, of course I drink. We love the fact that you now, we can now blame you legitimately, at least a little, for our addiction. But we hate what happens in CODA because we lose control over you and the situation. All of a sudden you're making your own decisions. You're looking out after yourself. You're being more assertive and we freaking hate that because we can't run you all over the map. But here's the really good thing that I want to tell you. If you're working in a codependent model, which says to the partner, you have so much trauma that you pick this troubled person. And if you work on your trauma and your past issues, unless the addict does in equal measure, you won't want to be with them anymore because you will have grown and self-actualized and you're not going to want to pick a healthier person. Well, what does that say to the addict? That they're awful, they're broken, that they're unredeemable. And probably as their partner grows, they never are going to get to stay with them. And if their partner were healthier, they never would have picked them in the first place. What a kick in the butt to an addict. To me, what prodependence says is very simple. Prodependence implies to the addict, the person that chose to love me, my wife, my partner, my family, they saw the good inside of me from the start and they still do. Despite all the horrible things that I've done and the shit that I've done, somewhere in their loving mind, they still see us and me in the light of our happiness. And what an amazing thing that there's someone out there who still loves me, who, who, has, who is holding on, who is holding on to the good me that even I don't believe in anymore. What an incredible gift to have someone in my life who can hold on to that image. Our partners don't hang on to us because they're sick. They hang on to us because they love us and they hope that over time things will get better. So my last slide. When did love become a pathology? If you love too much, could you please come by my house and make Thanksgiving dinner? Because I love people who love too much. We're going to play cards. We're going to go out to movies. We're going to have a great time. We can love all over each other. There can never be too much love. Now, you can, for sure, love inadequately, choose someone more based in emotion than a thought, and you choose the wrong person. You can love someone who doesn't love you back. You can love in ways that aren't productive to yourself or other people. You can love ways that do mirror your past problems and trauma. You can love the wrong people. You can love in ways that maybe cause more harm to you and others than good. You can love people who do not or cannot love you back, sad. 
but you can never love too much. And that really is the essence of what I have to talk about. Um, love is the strength that heals addiction, not detachment, not looking at pathology, but boundaried, well, well presented, consistent love. So that's the end of my talk. I think I'm right on time at the end of the talk, maybe a little over. Yeah, um, actually, yeah, you're a little bit over. So we're actually going to do a 15 minute break and be back for the next session. And questions will be at the end of the next session for Dr. Weiss. Okay. okay. May I say one more thing? Yep. My email is rob at seekingintegrity.com. It's rob at seekingintegrity.com. Dot com. And I say that because if you have a question that's really on your mind and you don't think you'll remember or you really just write me a note. I heard your lecture and I have this question. And I'll answer it for you. So there's also a site called prodependence.com, which uh, gives the lecture. It has videos and all that stuff. Um, one more little thing. This book has been taken up by Taylor Francis Rutledge, which is our largest academic publisher. They have been asked, they've asked me to create a clinical guide for prodependence that's going to go into our PhD, uh, masters and counseling programs. So this is a thing, it is moving forward and it will be coming forward as an alternative to codependency in the near future. All right, and I will post Dr. Rob's uh, email address on the next uh, chat feed for the next session. Okay, so we'll Great. see you all back here in 15 minutes and then uh, Dr. Weiss, if you can jump on that next link so we can get your uh, slides up for the next event. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Bye.